Welcome to the second part of East Capital Global Outlook series. And this time we are here together with uh, M. Raksakmak from Dubai. And my name is Peter Elam Håkansson in Stockholm. So, warm welcome, Emre. You've been you. running this fund now since December 2014, and you've been based in Dubai since 2016. Why should we care about global frontier markets? It's from my perspective, it's relatively simple. It's the same message we have been giving for the last 10 years. But I think now it's becoming more obvious. You have high economic growth, good environment for high expected returns. You have lower standard deviation compared to other asset classes, not higher. Let's talk more about that. But you also have close to all time low valuations, both from absolute and relative perspective with a very strong recent momentum. Mm -hmm. That sounds good. And uh, how does our strategy stand out a bit from the crowd then? Yeah, before maybe going into details, just to take a simple view of how we see the frontier markets environment, uh, we have a different description of the uh, markets, and this is a good alternative to emerging markets. The problem with emerging markets is that there is too much concentration. And now this concentration is having very negative effects on investor portfolios. You have top markets, China, Taiwan, South Korea, I call them the cats, plus India, Brazil, accounting for 80% of the index. Some investors nowadays are trying to get away a little bit from China, but the problem isn't solved by going to ex-China because you still have the high concentration issue with Taiwan and South Korea also having about 40% of the index and typical portfolios. When you look at frontier markets, on the other hand, there is a very narrow description of the MSCI. But what we do is to invest in these smaller emerging markets, i.e. frontier markets, plus some other of uh, smaller emerging markets, just to get a nice independent exposure from emerging markets. OK, that sounds good. But let's come back to the growth question. On the growth side, uh, I think it's pretty straightforward. These markets are coming from a very low base. They are not comparable to developed markets from many perspectives. But in terms of growth, uh, we have low growth in developed markets. Now, of course, we had some good years of stock market performance. But take a long term view going forward, developed markets will be growing by one to one and a half percent. Emerging markets, why they are interesting is because they are growing faster, but frontier markets and some of these selected smaller emerging markets, they are growing even faster compared to peers. So this is a very good uh, environment for companies uh, to flourish and grow their earnings. Mm, that's for sure. And I don't think this comes to a surprise to too many people that we see the growth in the front, frontier, park of, frontier market part of the world. But maybe the next point is more of a surprise on the uh, standard deviation and correlation between markets. It's a surprise because uh, unfortunately we have the views, the perceptions, uh, the assumptions about frontier markets. But let's have a look. Emerging markets, standard deviation, annual standard deviation is pretty high, as you can see. You go to developed markets. No surprise here, developed markets are having lower standard deviation, lower volatility. And then you expect the third column here with frontier markets going off the roof. But on the contrary, frontier markets are showing lower standard deviation compared to even developed markets. I think there are strong fundamental reasons to that. This is not a coincidence. It's a good uh, chart to show over the last 10 years, 10 out of 10 years, they had lower standard deviation compared to emerging markets and eight out of 10 years lower standard deviation compared to developed markets. How is this possible? Let's have a look at developed markets. Very obvious, developed markets, 90% in Europe and North America. 
very high correlations. Why is that? It's intuitive and it's very structural also. Geographical proximity, uh, economic ties, flow ties with everything. There is no benefits of diversification in the bigger scope of things. Look at emerging markets. There is still high correlations, China dominant, Asia dominant, with high correlations and volatile markets, you don't get the benefits of diversification as much. But in frontier markets, they are all over the place. There is Vietnam, there is Nigeria, there is Egypt, there is Romania. These markets have low correlations, but they also have negative correlations. And another perspective, some investors now looking for alternatives to China. Emerging markets index, almost 60%, let's say two thirds, close to two thirds by the cats, China, Taiwan, South Korea, and then you have two large markets. Ex-China is a way to get away from emerging markets a little bit, but then you still get 40% exposure to these two markets. Taiwan, there might be political issues, that's one thing. South Korea is essentially a developed market that's in the index just because of some technical issues on the currency trading. But then you also have high concentration in these four markets altogether. Then you want to go into EM small caps, but the problem isn't solved here because then you still have the high concentration with Chinese participation as well. And then top five markets accounting for almost 80% of that index. When you look at correlations also, this is documented here, very high correlations. If you look at correlations between EM, EMX China, EM, EM small cap, DMs correlations into EMs. But when you look at frontier markets, it looks like they have very low correlations, very you know low ties to this world flows, trade relations. So you are picking stocks in this nice environment with a nice diversification also that we are trying to achieve. You are going into companies in the Middle East, a bit in Asia, Africa, Eastern Europe, CIS. So this is a very balanced exposure that we are investing in. Mm -hmm. I see that. And what about the timing at the moment then, Emre? Timing, that's the nice part of it. Uh, I think we are, as we speak, I've been waiting for this moment. You know that, Peter, for the last 10 years, we have been talking about the first two points, primarily growth and standard deviation. But sometimes you need a bit of a trigger for these things to, to become more valuable in the eyes of investors. When you look at valuations, PE ratio is now as low as it gets. We had historically low levels in the middle of Fed rate hikes. Markets were coming down. Now, after a strong momentum even, we are at turning points of frontier markets at nine times only. Okay, will it be 10 times PE, 11 times PE, 12 times PE in the near future? Maybe not, but there is the earnings growth. But on top of that, there's the recent momentum and downside protection. I think downside protection is always very important. And going forward also from a relative perspective, we are at another sweet spot with the largest discount compared to emerging and developed markets. And what's even better is, of course, now we have a bit of momentum. On emerging markets, performance has been pretty poor. We had flattish emerging markets over the last five years. Since the end of COVID or uh, since 2020, let's call it, emerging markets were coming down. But one problem has been China, of course. If you look at the cats, cats have been driving the index back in 2020 during COVID tech period. But now cats have been dragging the index down. When you look at the remaining emerging markets in the index, then they are doing well, actually. If you eliminate the cats, focus on the one third of the index, they are doing well, driven by India nowadays, especially. Frontier markets were also doing well, especially after this tech rally, they were catching up and outperforming. But this is not uh, contradictory with our message. Our message is to invest in frontier markets and look for different opportunities in the small emerging market space. And when we look at our strategy, it's a nice uh, chart to see from our perspective, uh, stock picking allocation. And I think what also makes a big difference is that you can alternate between 
high rate environments, low rate environments, high oil prices, exporters, importers, with a lot of stock picking opportunities as well. Mm, true. Now, there's so many different market possibilities and market opportunities in, in the frontier space. So let's see how the fund has been doing in this type of environment then, please. Almost 10 years down the road, uh, we had a good track record, I believe. Uh, at least this is something that we will take from day one. Uh, we had nine uh, full years this, this year coming to an end soon. We had only one year with negative alpha. Uh, we are very happy with that. Uh, but if you look for our uh, consistency, I think track record is consistent in terms of the team. Of course, over the last 10 years, we had some changes on the way, uh, but we have an experienced and pretty stable team. Uh, sticking to our processes, a majority of alpha being generated from stock picking. Uh, we have ESG analysis integrated in our processes from you know, from the very beginning to the end. And in terms of assets, we are now seeing some more interest. I think people realize the momentum, people realize the valuations, uh, what's happening in frontier markets. So we are uh, now investing more in these markets with the help of these recent inflows. Uh, but what I also would like to mention is that when we invest in these companies, uh, beyond all the points that we talked about, we are investing in an environment where you have high growth, low volatility, attractive valuations from absolute and relative perspective. But we are investing in companies that are growing their earnings by 15% a year on average. There are good years with 30%, 20%. There are some years like 2020 with COVID earnings were declining. But overall, uh, I think it's been pretty stable mid-teens type of earnings growth. And this is what we expect going forward for the strategy as well. Mm. So super nice combination then with the uh, low valuation as well overall in, in the markets and uh, to see this type of earnings growth as well in the fund. Uh, I forgot to say in the beginning of the webinar that of course you can post your questions in the in the chat and uh, we will take them up as uh, you find suitable during the, the uh, uh, webcast. But uh, before that maybe uh, Emery, I know you also have some thoughts on the inflation in this part of the world. Could you explore a bit on that as well? Yeah, inflation is what everyone is talking about. Still, everyone is talking about uh, for the last two years almost. Uh, but you might have another impression here talking about impressions and assumptions. This is what is very difficult to break sometimes. This is what we have been trying to break. Standard deviation, volatility. This was one case. But as for inflation also, Number one, we don't need to invest in all these markets. They might be in our universe, but we don't have to invest. So we avoid a lot of markets. I think number one uh, rule in investing is sometimes uh, to survive. So you just don't want to go where you don't you are uh, losing money as an investor. But from inflation perspective now, inflation peaked in frontier markets. That's very similar to the US inflation and European inflation, so they were very close to 10% in the US, exceeding 10% uh, in the EU. But many markets now in the frontier space, it starts from Peru and the Philippines, they are seeing below 5% inflation again after the peak. And when you look at the 10% threshold, single digit threshold, now many of these frontier markets and smaller emerging markets are below 10%. So there are a few struggling markets, Egypt, Pakistan, Nigeria. I think Kazakhstan inflation will be uh, behaving going forward, but some markets are struggling. In those markets, we have two options. Number one is simply we don't invest. We don't have to invest. Number two is we might have some special opportunities with inflated earnings and stable currencies. Then you get good returns in US dollar terms. So we are very selective in where we are investing from this perspective. And so while we we are at it, maybe we should uh, then uh, touch base on the on the currencies as well, as it is uh, so much linked with inflation as well. It is linked to the inflation, and it's linked to my um, case for survival. Uh, we just need to survive. We just need to be careful from a top-down perspective. We are stock pickers, but top-down matters, especially in these markets. In terms of allocation, we mined currencies. 
and uh, we follow these markets from a top-down perspective. Uh, but if you look at the allocations now, so we classify based on the vulnerability of the currencies. We have a very simple classification. The group one is strong currencies, group two somewhere in the middle, and three are currencies that might get really volatile. And you can see that volatility, for instance, when you look at Egypt, Pakistan, or Kenya, we have seen these currencies losing 30, 40, 50 percent compared to the US dollar over the last few years. But this was actually the reason why frontier markets are performing now, because economic rebalancing is taking place in many of these markets. But in the bigger scope of things, we also have a lot of balanced economies, such as the Vietnam, we have Romania, their own currency, but this is very closely tied to EU. We have the GCC currencies. These are pegged currencies in Saudi, UAE, Kuwait. You get US dollar returns. And then you have the likes of Slovenia using Euro, Philippines, pretty balanced economy. So it's not only uh, about doom and gloom. I think this, there's, uh, this is more nuanced than how it looks, how it feels, how it is perceived. Uh, and when you look at the currency exposure, for instance, for our strategy, for about 90% of the strategy is now tied into either balanced economies, packed currencies or stable currencies. We have that 10% component, but that's a very conscious hand-picked companies in some of these markets with relatively volatile currencies. Okay, thank you. Let's see what it looks on the question side at the moment. Mm -hmm. Okay, there is one here. Biden recently went to Vietnam and it's also the largest frontier market. What is your view at present on that market? No, this, this was a good visit. I think we need this kind of events to start with. As managers, we follow Vietnam for more than a decade now. Uh, the agreements they are signing now are taking Vietnam-US relations to another level, another chapter. We have seen trade booming after 2013 with an agreement. And then after 2020 with COVID, so there is the structural issues and there's the momentum. But with COVID and US-China relations going sour, we have seen another uptick in trade relations. Now it's time for FDIs. Vietnam has been exporting to the US, but now it's time for higher technology, renewables, uh, better software, more productive capacities in Vietnam. And all these agreements that are signed between the two, two countries are going to improve relations. But not only that, they are going to improve the production base in Vietnam to a more value added perspective. So I think that's very good news. And when you look at the equities there, uh, these are typical Asian equities growing fast with large populations, growing populations. But in terms of valuation, Vietnamese stocks have been lagging. So I think it will also help over the longer term for Vietnamese equities to re-rate. So I'm very happy for the latest developments. Sounds good, thank you. And here is another one which I think you will like. It says that the Economist front page is now about the Middle Eastern economies. What is your view on those economies? I would like this, you, you, you knew it. Uh, I, I'm based in Dubai, just as a reminder, and I see this. I think uh, all these front pages aren't enough to express what's happening in the region. Uh, it's a booming region. We have seen it a decade ago. Uh, if you look at the performance of Middle Eastern markets back in 2012, 2013, with the oil prices also going up, uh, economic cyclical recovery in place, or back in 2007, 2008, but I think this time it's different. There are uh, many new regulations or uh, you know new reforms in Saudi Arabia. Uh, you may see the half full, uh, half empty part of the glass. You might call Saudi Arabia a little bit backward looking or a little bit lagging in terms of regulatory perspective. But I think if you look at the steps that have been taken over the last five years, you would also remember, Peter, you had to go to uh, the embassy, wait in the queues, get your visa. Uh, and then going down there, you, you would be waiting. But now everything is different. Uh, you just do everything online. Lots of tourists are going there. Uh, it's a completely different environment. Uh, in the UAE, it's also the same. Uh, you have a very strong up uh, uptick in the economic cycle. 
Uh, but now with the long-term visas being issued for foreigners, I think it's a different environment. So if you look at all these markets one by one with the currency pegs, with the strong economic activity, I think they are not only economic, uh, sorry, only oil exposure. I think there's significantly more and stronger substance behind that. And it's not a coincidence that Middle Eastern markets have been performing very strongly over the last two, three years. Mm. True, and I also remember that I mean, we are traveling extensively in this strategy all over the world, but the, the first trip was actually to the Middle Eastern economies, and that by that time it was really Saudi, which we started to explore back in 2014. Time flies. Unfortunately, we have reached the, the end of this webinar. Uh, I would like to thank you, Emre, for a comprehensive view of the global frontier markets at present and the opportunities. And I would also like to thank all the uh, participants and remind everyone about them, that the next one is coming up soon and that will be about China. Stay tuned. Thanks a lot. Thank you.